All right, welcome back, everybody. Hope you all had a good snow day yesterday, and I know you're all looking forward to spring break. Uh, we're, we spent last week talking about your second major speech in here, which is your tech name speech or your professional speech. We're going to spend the next couple of weeks in here actually working toward persuasion. Uh, we're going to be thinking ahead a little bit toward your third major speech, which you'll do as a small group deliberation. I'm going to teach you a lot of persuasion theory because in my experience, a lot of undergrads think that they're very good at making persuasive claims and supporting them. Uh, I've seen a lot of papers, I've graded a lot of speeches where that's not necessarily the case. And so I want to start with some basics to help you become better at arguing. This is thought in uh, public speaking, but a lot of what makes public speaking effective is that a lot of public speaking happens in persuasive settings. And so I want you to be able to be good at making persuasive arguments. I want you to be able to find your voices. I want you to be able to make arguments that other adults will start taking seriously. So I know that some of you at 19 or 20 years old don't feel like you can make a whole lot of a difference in this world. We're going to talk uh, over the next couple of weeks about how to make better arguments. And we're also going to talk about uh, civic and community engagement opportunities that you might get involved in and how, might, how you might use persuasion in those contexts to try and make change. So we're going to start at the basics today. This is one of my favorite theories. It was actually a big grounding theory behind a lot of my dissertation work. It's coming back from as long as 2,500 years ago. Uh, this is what's called stasis theory. And stasis theory just helps us figure out what we're arguing about when we have multiple arguments going on simultaneously. Have any of you ever had the experience where you've been fighting with a best friend or a significant other, and you start fighting about one thing, and then like three hours later, the conversation has morphed so much that you don't even know what you're fighting about anymore? It's like a lot of married couples where you start fighting about who's going to do the dishes, and then suddenly you find yourselves fighting about your in-laws and how your family never liked me, right? Uh, stasis theory is a good way to take a step back from that and try to figure out what it is that we're actually arguing about. It's a way of classifying and clarifying arguments so that we don't have multiple arguments spiral into one another. So we're going to talk a little bit about persuasion for the next couple weeks. And what we're going to be starting with is the just basic differences between informative speaking and persuasive speaking. So your first two speeches in this class are mostly informative. You're teaching your audience something that uh, they didn't already know about some topic that you find interesting. Tell me a little bit about what makes persuasion different from just purely informative speaking. Okay, so there's usually a couple different options that are available to you. You usually have a position. The people in your audience might have a different position, right? We talked about friendly, hostile, and mixed audiences when we talked about audience analysis. Persuasive speaking can be challenging because you're trying to persuade people to give up their own opinions in order to support your own. Are there any other differences that make persuasive speaking different from informative speaking? Yeah, so a lot of times when we have informative speaking, we're just uh, sharing things about the world that most of us can agree upon. There's no controversy there. When we get to persuasive speaking, there's a little bit of controversy there. Sometimes we're making value judgments about what's right or wrong or what should or shouldn't be the case. That's actually a lot of what we're going to be talking about. There's another difference that I think is really important between informative and persuasive speaking, and that is the quality of the evidence that you provide for persuasive speaking is usually held to a much higher standard. Last week in, lecture, in lab, you should have talked about evidence and reasoning quite a bit. Your standards for what constitutes good evidence or what constitutes effective reasoning is going to go way up when you have persuasive speaking. And the reason for that is because most of the time when you have people in your audience who don't already agree with you, they might be coming at things from a hostile audience member's perspective, and they might be looking for all the reasons not to believe you or to believe the people that you cite in your speech. So I want you to take persuasion very seriously. What a lot of this translates to is that persuasive speaking is often a lot harder than informative speaking. It's not always easy to do a persuasive speech. I want you to be able to get better at it. And part of getting better at it is knowing what makes persuasion different from informative speaking. On the last slide, I had a, just a continuum up there. A lot of people will try to separate in, informative speaking and persuasive speaking and say they're two totally different things and never the two shall meet. I like to think of it more as a continuum rather than like a black and white or a Venn diagram. 
in that uh, any act, even if it's just purely informative, or if we think of it as just purely informative, can actually be persuasive. I'll give you an example. Let's say we're at a birthday party and I'm singing happy birthday to someone. How could that possibly be a persuasive act? I wish you a happy birthday or sing happy birthday to you. We like to think that's just informative. I'm just marking your birthday. <laughs> it could actually be a persuasive act if I want to show you that I care about you, if I want to show you that you trust me, if I want to show you that I'm your good friend. Maybe we didn't always get along, but if I'm here singing happy birthday to you and you see me singing and I'm very enthusiastic about it, that could actually be a persuasive act. So they're not wholly separate categories, and I want you to start thinking about how even just informative speaking has a persuasive element to it. We're going to start with some basic building blocks of what constitutes persuasion, what makes it different from information. I'm going to start there by going to kind of an odd place. I'm going to go to grammar and syntax. Uh, every sentence in the English language has what's called a subject and a predicate. Does anybody know what, the, what those are and what that means? Has anybody encountered those terms before? Sorry, I can't quite hear you. Yeah, so the subject is usually the noun of the sentence. It's the person, place, or thing that's going to do something. The predicate is what that thing is doing. So I have here the temperature. That's my subject. I have the predicate, which is, is 36 degrees Fahrenheit? Almost every, every sentence in the English language will have both of these things. The shortest sentence in the English language is actually I am, period, right? I is your subject, being or existence, I am is the verb. Putting those two together means that we have a full sentence and not a sentence fragment. I know that sounds really boring and dry. I'm going to explain why I'm doing this in a second here. The idea behind information is that we have a subject and a predicate that's not controversial in any case. When we're dealing with persuasion, what we're dealing with are what we call topoi and stases. So topos in Greek is the word for a place. It's also the word that a lot of uh, Greeks use for ideas. If you remember when we watched Joshua Fowler's Memory Champion video, he talked about this, that a topos is literally a place, but it's also the root of the word topic. Topic is very similar to subject. The stasis is where we have our controversy. It's something that could be otherwise. That's one of the basic definitions that Aristotle gives to rhetoric, something that could be otherwise. So I'll give you a second example here. We have our subject, or topos ludifis. The stasis that I'm attaching to that is, is disgusting. If any of you have ever eaten lutefisk, some of you might be Norwegian or Scandinavian, you might have grown up with lutefisk, you might actually really like it. A lot of other people who didn't grow up with lutefisk would agree that lutefisk is, lutefisk is disgusting. The disgusting part of it is a controversial word. It's a value judgment that we're placing on the taste of lutefisk. And when we're dealing with controversy, we're in the realm of stasis. When we're dealing with non-controversy, we're in the realm of pure fact, pure object, object, objective information. So that's what we're trying to deal with here. And what I'm going to give you today is a theory for parsing out when we have a controversial stasis, what stasis are we at, and why are we arguing at that stasis, and how do we argue at that stasis. There's a couple different kinds of arguments that we can have, and they often bleed into one another. And that's how you can go from having an argument about doing dishes to having an argument about fighting about your in-laws. Stasis theory was designed in the Greek courts as a way of stepping back and slowing down so that you could have one argument at a time and not get too far ahead of yourself. And this is going to be really important for your third speech when you get into deliberation because all of your deliberations are going to be at one of the five stases, and it's going to have implications for the other four. So let's talk about this idea of a topos. So topos is, uh, or, yeah, topos in Greek is a place. So we could, have, uh, we could have it be a literal place like Newtown, Connecticut. We could also have it as a figurative idea. I talked about Newtown and the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting in my dissertation. And one of the controversies that I had to deal with were conspiracy theories saying that the shooting in Connecticut never actually happened, that it was a government conspiracy, that there were crisis actors. There was an argument over whether the events that we all know as the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting actually took place. And I had to fight with conspiracy theorists at the stasis of fact over whether this event actually happened. 
that's something that we have to deal with. So we're dealing with possibly literal places, but it also could be a figurative idea like a school shooting. When we're talking about stasis theory, there's five different places where we could have arguments. And it's important that we only try to bear, uh, pare it down to one argument at a time. So I'm going to give you the different types of stases. These are all unresolved questions, and that's what makes it kind of confusing for some students, is that you think of the term fact, and we like to think that facts are always agreed upon. We'll get there in a minute here. But these are the five stases, and this is what we argue about. I'll take some time to go into each one in detail, but another thing to remember is that they're usually interconnected. They're usually related to one another. So we're going to start at the stasis of fact or conjecture. It could be either one, depending on which term you like better. I like the stasis of conjecture better because fact connotes that it's all agreed upon and that we're all objective. So the stasis of fact or conjecture is at the basic level, what happened here? We, could, uh, we just talked about the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. We could have a factual or conjectural argument over whether those events actually happened the way that the media reported them, the way the government documented them. When we're dealing with the stasis of fact or conjecture, we're trying to learn uh, different types of being. We're trying to see what is or isn't in the world, what does or doesn't, what could or couldn't be, what will or won't be the case. We're talking about facts and, uh, to borrow from Kelly, Kellyanne Conway, alternative facts. So this is when the factual record is not entirely settled. We have different reports of the same thing. Imagine that you are driving to campus today and the roads are really icy and you get into a car accident. You're going to have one version of the story. The, the driver that you hit is going to have another version of the story. Maybe they're going to say that you ran a stop sign. Maybe you're going to say that they fishtailed. Maybe somebody was on a cell phone, right? There's lots of different variables that when the police officer shows up and you're both fighting with each other over who caused the accident, you have to describe factually what happened. How did we get in this accident? And you're going to have different versions of that. So when we're dealing with the stasis of fact or conjecture, we have controversy over whether something is happening or not. Does that make sense? Some head nods, maybe? We'll get into this a little bit with some examples, and hopefully it'll clarify a little bit. So one question that we could ask at the stasis of fact or conjecture is whether human beings are alone in the universe. In other words, do aliens exist? Somebody give me an argument for why aliens might exist. We don't know the answer to this question, but we could conjecture yes or no. Yes? Okay, so we know the Milky Way galaxy. We know that there are many other stars and planets out there in the universe. We know that we can't get to all of those stars and planets in the universe. We know that our planet has life, and therefore it's possible, it's actually likely, if we look at how many galaxies are out there, that somewhere out there, there might be another life form. Somebody give me the opposite argument. Tell me that aliens don't exist. How would you know? It doesn't have to be your argument. Just play devil's advocate here. How do you make that argument? Okay, so if aliens existed, we would probably have some signs of alien life. My lab section the other day talked about different types of reasoning. Sign reasoning is one of those. There would be indicators. There would be communication from other alien life, particularly if they're at least as intelligent as we are or possibly more intelligent than we are. So we could have this argument for days, but unless somebody can definitively prove that aliens do or don't exist, it's all still controversial. We're still in the realm of stasis because things could be otherwise. I'll give you another example here. Let's try this one out. There will be another attack on the scale of the Pearl Harbor or 9-11 in our lifetime. Somebody try and tell me why that might be the case. Go ahead and make an argument. It doesn't have to be your own argument. Just if you were going to support that claim, how would you argue it? Okay, so we might think that we have very strong security in place, but maybe over time we're going to get lax on that when there aren't uh, attacks happening on a regular basis. Okay, somebody else want to try? Yeah. 
Okay, it's happened in the past. We have this quotation from George Santayana saying, those who forget history are bound to repeat it, right? We have this idea that history repeats itself. So it's possible that if it happened in 1945, or 1941, if it happened again in 2001, then it's possible that by 2061, when most of you are still alive, that there will be another attack on this scale. Somebody else argue why this might not be the case. Why do you think there might not be an attack on this scale in our lifetime? I think it's the flip side of what our friend over there was saying about how we actually have a lot of security measures in place now post 9-11. It's actually much harder to get on a plane. It's much harder to get uh, access to weapons like that, right? There are lots of different ways that we could speculate about this, but it's very hard for us to predict the future Sometimes it's even hard for us to understand what happened in the past or what might be happening in the present. And so when we're at this basis of fact or conjecture, we're dealing with being in existence. All of those be verbs, is, can, does, will, that's what we're dealing with. And we like to think of the stasis of fact or conjecture as easiest to settle. If we just have a factual record that we all can agree upon, then we'll be in a good place and we can move on and we can just make arguments based on those facts that we all accept as true. And yet last semester I got a speech about flat earthers, right? People who believe that the universe is flat. There are people out there who believe that. The stasis of fact or conjecture, despite the name fact and its connotations of objectivity, is actually the most difficult of the five stases to have arguments about. Because it has a lot to do with our perceptions and our senses and what we know to be true based on observation or based on empirical uh, logic that we can uh, objectively ev evaluate and measure. So that's what we're dealing with at that stasis. And that's the first of our stases. And these go in order. They expand upon one another. The second stasis that we have, the second place where we could have controversy, controversy if we're not at the stasis of factor conjecture, is over definitions. When we're arguing about definitions, we're asking, what is this thing? What does it mean? So to give you an example, when I was a little kid, if someone asked me what a tomato was, if they asked me if it was a fruit or a vegetable, I would say that it's a vegetable. Somebody go into the mind of a six-year-old and tell me, why might I say that a tomato is a vegetable? It goes in the salad, right? The only place I ever see tomatoes is in a salad. It's in a salad with lettuce and onions and broccoli and spinach and whatever else. Uh, I know that vegetables go in a salad and therefore tomatoes must be a vegetable. That was my argument as a six-year-old. I was then corrected and told that tomatoes are a fruit. That's actually the case. But why are tomatoes a fruit? Does anybody know? Yeah. Good, so they have seeds within a fleshy coating. That means that they are technically a fruit, even though they don't have as much sugar as, say, strawberries or pineapple or grapes, <coughs> right? So tomato, we came up with this arbitrary definition of what constitutes a fruit and what constitutes a vegetable. If we were in another culture, we might define those things differently. I'll give you another example here, the term terrorist. Uh, a lot of times, one group who refers to another group as a terrorist is usually an outsider to that group. They've usually been attacked by that group. Most people who have been attacked by someone that they would label as a terrorist would say they are different from us. They have this mentality. They are trying to destroy the country, whatever it may be. A lot of people who are labeled as terrorists wouldn't self-identify as terrorists. Can you think of other terms that insiders of that group might use to describe why they decided to bomb a building? Yeah, freedom fighters is probably the most common one, right? Whether it's Palestinians in Israel-Palestine or Basque separatists in Spain or Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka, we have lots of different groups who would call themselves freedom fighters, and they're saying it's actually the other side that's the terrorists. We are fighting for our freedom because their military or their laws are unjust, and therefore we are not the terrorists. They are actually the terrorists. We get into a lot of fights about definitions, and there's a lot at stake in how we define particular things. So we could have lots of definitional arguments, and most of the time when we're dealing with definitions, we have to deal with what we call definitional criteria. It's what constitutes this thing that we're saying has a clear definition. Tomatoes have seeds, therefore they are a fruit. Having seeds is one of the definitional criteria for establishing what constitutes a fruit or a vegetable. We have lots of definitions that we fight about, 
and we fight about them for a lot of different reasons. So I have another definitional argument up here. There are a lot of people who are trying to say that Facebook and Twitter and other social media are like drugs. What does it mean to define something as a drug? If we were to come up with definitional criteria for a drug, what might they be? Yeah? Something that changes your mental status for good or for bad. Okay, something that changes your mental status for good or for bad. Are there other things that we could say about drugs? What are other criteria that we might use to establish what constitutes a drug? They're addictive. Yeah, something that's addictive, right? How many of you spend more than an hour a day on social media? Quite a few of you, that's okay. Um, there are lots of people who would say, it's very hard for me to not be on my phone. Some of you might actually be on your phones as I'm talking to you right now, right? It can be very addictive. We could have the argument over whether Facebook is something like a drug or whether it's not. One of the other definitional criteria that we might say about a drug is it has to be a substance, right? A lot of the other drugs that we classify as drugs are alcohol or pills or marijuana or things that we put into our body. We don't put Facebook and social media into our body, and so we could have the argument over whether that constitutes a drug or not. Another way of talking about this is maybe we have definitional criteria established in legal documents. So we have this constitutional notion of cruel and unusual punishment. And we could have arguments over whether capital punishment or the death penalty by lethal injection constitutes cruel and unusual punishment. This was actually a topic that made the news a few years ago because a lot of other countries that make the drugs for lethal injections decided that this did constitute what they saw as cruel and unusual punishment. They might not have used that language. But we actually got a lot of, the US got a lot of our drugs for lethal injections from countries in Europe who have abolished the death penalty because they think it's cruel. And so what happened is there was actually a shortage of the drug cocktail that was necessary to give someone a lethal injection in the United States. And so there were uh, companies in the United States and prisons in the United States experimenting with other drug cocktails. And what happened is that those drug cocktails actually didn't quite work. We have the European ones were actually much more effective they were supposed to be the most humane way to kill someone. And what happened is when they experimented with some of these drug cocktails, these people had very violent reactions to them. It was actually like they were convulsing, they were foaming at the mouth. There were lots of problems with the drug cocktail. And so we could have an argument over whether lethal injection constitutes cruel and unusual punishment. And there were lots of people arguing on both sides of this, right? The pro-death penalty people were saying, well, if they committed a crime, they probably deserved to, su to suffer for that crime. A lot of the anti-death penalty people were arguing that there are a lot of cases where people are falsely accused and falsely convicted and they shouldn't be subjected to that kind of treatment. So this is the kind of stuff that's at stake with what we mean when we're talking about the stasis of definition. That's what we're arguing about there. The third one's probably the easiest one for a lot of you to wrap your heads around. And that is the stasis of causes and consequences. This is where we move from what, um, what's happening in the world and what does it mean to does X cause Y? Or what are the effects of W, right? If I drink, if I drink regularly, will I get cirrhosis of the liver, right? Does smoking constitute lung cancer? We saw a lot of examples of causal arguments being put forth when the tobacco companies went under trial in the early 90s. And a lot of people were trying to make the case that smoking doesn't cause lung cancer, and that's something that a lot of us have since started to accept as fact. If you smoke regularly, if you smoke a lot, you are much more likely to develop lung cancer and emphysema and heart disease and all these other things. But we have to establish scientifically what kinds of effects does doing something have. And it's sometimes hard to establish causality. I'm gonna give you another example, and I know my lab students have already seen this example here. Um, when we, Talk about violent video games. A lot of people say that violent video games cause violent behavior in children. And there are lots of studies that have been done on both sides of this. And there were people who came around a decade ago and said, we're gonna study this from kind of a big picture bird's eye view perspective at 30,000 feet. We're gonna look at this and say, does violent video game playing cause violent behavior in children? And there were two big meta-studies that came out at the same time, or about a year apart. One of those big meta-studies studied about 300 different micro-studies, individual studies, and it looked at the conclusions of about 300 studies, 
and it said there's an irrefutable conclusion that exposure to violent media increases aggression. That is, it's been demonstrated so many times that we can take it as basically a causal fact. There was another study that came out about a year later that said the current analysis, it looked at about uh, you know, 200 other studies that said the current analysis does not support the conclusion that violence leads, uh, violent media leads to aggressive behavior. It cannot be concluded at this time that media violence presents a significant public health risk. We like to think that when we're doing social science that we can define definitively causality. A lot of you, if you've taken social science methods courses, have probably heard the phrase correlation does not equal causation, which means if there looks like there's a relationship between two things, it doesn't necessarily mean that X causes Y. There could be other stuff going on here. My master's thesis advisor regularly used to say that human behavior is infinitely variable. And so I'll tell you that I've seen lots of teenagers who play a lot of Call of Duty or Grand Theft Auto and don't end up uh, causing violence in any capacity. There are some students or some young adults who seem predisposed to that kind of stuff and it might activate latent responses in them. So it's kind of confusing. We like to think that social science can answer this question for us, but a lot of times it doesn't necessarily do that. We've got another example here. You get all these causal examples in advertising as well. I'm obviously not endorsing this particular kind of body spray, but this particular body spray company likes to tell you that if you're a guy and you wear our body spray, that you're going to get all the women. Somebody tell me why that is probably not the case. Yeah. So this particular body spray does not actually attract a lot of women. A lot of people think it smells absolutely disgusting. I actually came across a study a few years ago that says that so many young adults, like teenagers, use body sprays like this one. And the place where they're most likely to use it, anybody want to guess? Raise your hand. Anybody want to guess? Where, they are, where, they're, where are you likely to put this on? The locker room. The locker room, right? It's right after gym class. You're like, oh, I just got really sweaty playing basketball. I probably stink. If I just spray this body spray over myself, I'll smell better again, and it'll all be fine. And then you probably know that it doesn't actually work that way, that what happens is you, both of the smells kind of merge, and you can smell them both at the same time. It doesn't really work that way. In fact, it kind of has the opposite effect that you smell a little bit of the body spray, but you smell a lot of the BO, and your brain associates them together, it's actually likely to repel people of the opposite sex, right? So this is the kind of causal argument that we make a lot of the time. Let's move on from causality. We'll get to our fourth stasis, and this is the one that one of you mentioned as what distinguishes persuasion from information. The fourth stasis is value judgments, and value judgments are really tricky. Value judgments are another one of those really fraught stases that are really complicated and really hard to argue about. Essentially what they come down to are arguments of good or bad, but there's lots of different categories of good or bad that are possible for you. So you've got ethical or unethical, beautiful or ugly, necessary, unnecessary, productive, unproductive, wise, unwise. Anytime that you're making a value judgment, you're trying to say this thing is better than that thing. And we like to think that when we have value judgments about which beer is better, or which food tastes better, or which art we like better, that there's a definitive capital T truth that we can all understand and agree upon, and people who just don't see it are stupid, or they're duped, or they're just wrong. Value judgments are really hard to argue about because a lot of us have different aesthetic tastes and a lot of us have different ethical systems that we were raised in. And so if you think back to our lesson on communication ethics, you know that I hate teaching communication ethics because it's so complicated. I can't do justice to communication ethics in one semester. And the reason for that is because there's lots of different ways at arriving at answers to these questions of good or bad. So we can talk about examples of whether that movie was great or whether that movie sucked, right? We can make arguments for that, but if somebody already disagrees with us at the outset, it's probably pretty hard to convince them otherwise. We could talk about what it means to be a good Christian. This is where value and definition kind of merge, right? We have the one person who goes to church regularly, who gives a lot of money to Christian charities, but lives their lives not in accordance with biblical precepts. 
We have another person who lives kind of a moral and ethical life, but they never go to church, right? Which one is the better Christian? We could have lots of different argues about, arguments about that answer to that question. When we're dealing with value judgments, it's very hard to convince people because like definitions, value judgments often rely upon criteria. So if you're fighting with your instructor about what grade you should get on your speech, chances are your instructor has a rubric with the things that you were supposed to do and the things that you maybe did or didn't do. And you're going to have to have an argument over what constitutes a good speech. That's what we're arguing about at the stasis of value. So we could have arguments about aesthetics, whether Pepsi is better than Coke. I happen to like Dr. Pepper better than both of them. But we could have lots of different arguments, and half of you in the room would probably be on one side, and half of you in the room would probably be on the other side. It's hard to convince people why one is better than the other. Do we go for taste? Do we go for color? Do we go for how it makes us feel? Do we go with corporate ethics and what the company does, right? There are lots of different definitional criteria and value criteria that we could use to establish why one is better than the other. A lot of you also will have arguments about this, right? Whether breastfeeding older children, let's say children over two years or three years, is wrong, or whether that's immoral or some kind of other value judgment that we could put on that, right? When we see a seven-year-old nursing, some of you might think, oh, that's beautiful, that's, you know, that's what's intended. Other people might say, no, they're too old for that, it's getting weird, they're a little too, a little too old, they're a little too understanding, a little too close to puberty. Maybe this is not something that we want to deem acceptable. You could have lots of arguments about this, but when it comes to, what it comes down to at the end of the day is individual parents making their decisions and defending those decisions. We have lots of different arguments with the stasis of value. They're hard to come by. The last, uh, the last stasis that we have here is the stasis of policy. And the stasis of policy is instead of dealing with can and does or will or is it possible like the stasis of fact or conjecture, the stasis of policy is arguing what we should or shouldn't do. Should the state of North Dakota legalize marijuana? Some of you might want to make that speech. I'll tell you that that speech is one of the most cliche speeches that undergrads give. But it's gotten a little bit more interesting in the last few years since Colorado and a handful of other states have legalized marijuana. When I first started teaching, that was not the case. And a lot of students were making really abstract arguments about why it might be beneficial. But until we had the concrete evidence from the states that had legalized it, we had to talk about kind of abstractly whether this was a good or bad idea and why. Now we can look at what's happening in Colorado and those other states and we might be able to make better arguments. I could also have this question of whether I should shave my head. A few years ago I had my students give speeches where they decided to uh, advocate for their favorite charities and I decided to sabotage this particular activity because I had a friend who was uh, making donations to an organization to fight childhood cancer. And this friend happened to be getting married soon and she really wanted to shave her head. It was just bad timing right before the wedding. And so I said, you know what? If you all raise over $100 as a class, I will shave my head. That's not something that I've ever done before this, not something that I probably will ever do again, but it is something that in the moment I decided was a good idea. We have lots of arguments at the stasis of policy and this is the last stasis for a reason. It's the stasis of action. If you think back to last week when we talked about Monroe's motivated sequence, that's a lot of what persuasive speaking is usually geared toward. It's getting people not just to think differently, but to act differently. That's what we're dealing with here. So we could have arguments over whether the United States should switch to the metric system. Some of you want to argue why that might be a good idea. I've given you an example on the left here. There are three countries in the world that currently do not use the metric system. We've got the US, Liberia, and Myanmar. Those are the only countries that do not use the metric system. Everywhere else, if you go to Canada, if you go to Europe, right, they're going to use the metric system, so we might as well switch to it. Somebody else want to make an argument for why switching to the metric system might be a good idea? Okay, so we don't have any discrepancies. If we have different people, some of whom were raised with the metric system, some with the English system, if we have different people on the same project, they can all speak the same language and we don't have to worry about whether we're measuring differently. Okay? Other reasons why it might be a good idea? Yeah? Okay, if you're a scientist, you probably already use the metric system, right? 
Uh, a lot of people in science labs don't talk about things in feet or pounds, right? They use the metric system. Yeah? Have you ever used a unit of length over, say, like miles? There's just some weird words that make no sense. Okay, so some of the terminology from the English system are also kind of messy. They don't really make a whole lot of sense. Somebody defend why we should stay with our current system. Okay, so our country used imperial units, we put a man on the moon. So maybe our system is better for science and technology. Yeah? It costs a lot of money to switch to the metric system that is changing road signs and changing all of our internal mechanisms for measurement. Yeah, so we're already kind of accustomed to it. We have a whole bunch of things in place. We would have to replace all of our measurements, all of our road signs of miles per hour would suddenly be in, uh, in kilometers per hour. Every time I drive to Winnipeg, I have to like look very carefully at my dashboard. We don't want to have to do that, right? Yeah, it's really heavily ingrained in our society. It's hard for those of us who are raised on the imperial system to think in units that we don't understand. It would take us a while to switch over to it. One more. Okay, so we would say maybe it's un-American. There's a history argument to be made there saying that we've always done it this way. Why should we switch it now? Good. Let's go to another uh, policy argument. Another policy argument is that the institutions of higher ed in the United States, so all of our colleges and universities, should just do away with grading entirely. I kind of like this idea in theory. I'm not sure that I like this idea in practice. Can somebody make an argument for why this would be a good idea? How many of you like getting graded on your assignments? Some of you, okay. Some, a lot of you probably don't like the anxiety that comes with grades, right? We're seeing an uptick in anxiety and depression in universities, right? There's lots of different reasons why by the time you're 18 or 19 years old, you might not need to rely on an A minus or a C plus to tell you how you did on an assignment. Maybe there are other ways of getting at how good you are at your subject area. Somebody defend our current institution of why we should continue to have letter grades. Yeah? Okay, so maybe it's fairer, maybe it's more accurate. Okay, so a lot of people are extrinsically motivated. That means that they need someone else to tell them what they should be doing. They need some kind of higher standard to hold themselves to. They're not intrinsically motivated. They don't just do it because they enjoy it. They do it because of the product or the results or the evaluation that they get as a result of doing it. So some of you might lose motivation if we don't have letter grades in place, right? We could see a lot of different arguments on both sides of this. What I'm getting at here and the reason I share this with you is because the Stacy's are what I like to think of as interdependent. A lot of people would like to say that when you have arguments, they're all independent of one another and we're just arguing freely based on whatever evidence and reasoning we have. It's actually the opposite with stasis theory. When we're dealing with stasis theory, what happens at one stasis usually rarely stays at that stasis. Usually if we're arguing something about uh, the stasis of definition, there might be a value judgment, there might be a policy judgment and vice versa. Also, when we're arguing at the stasis of policy and we're dealing with should or shouldn't, what we often have are unresolved questions at the stasis of fact or conjecture or definition or somewhere else along the line. I share this with you again because your policy deliberations are going to be oriented toward that final what we should or should not do. All of your, uh, all of your thesis statements for your final deliberations at the end of the semester will follow the format of some governing body out there should and then some specific policy who's in charge of this particular thing and what should they do differently. There's something that you don't like with the way that the world is and how it exists right now. Maybe if I make a good uh, argument, I can change that. So I'm gonna walk you through an example to show you just how interconnected some of the Stacy's are. We're gonna look at the issue of abortion and we're gonna look at it. I'm not interested in where you currently feel about the issue of abortion. I'm not interested in trying to persuade you to come to my position on abortion. I'm hoping that by the end of this lesson, you won't know what my position on abortion is. 
but I want you to see why the concept of abortion has been so controversial in the United States. It's not just that we have different policy de decisions over what the United States should or should not allow when it comes to abortion, but it often comes down to very basic factual questions that we can't answer. And part of what I'm trying to get you away from is this idea of a bumper sticker mentality, right? We like to take really complex issues in the United States and make them really short and concise and beat people over the head with them. We like these pithy statements that are just kind of uh, blunt and rude and in your face and get you thinking, and if you're not on my side, then you're wrong, right? We see lots of different examples of bumper stickers that talk about abortion and we come at them from very different perspectives. There are a lot of assumptions embedded behind every single one of these bumper stickers and they're really messy. And worse than that, a lot of the arguments that we're starting to have about abortions are not on bumper stickers on the back of our cars, but they're on Twitter and Facebook, right? We have these really short arguments, we think we can win them. Most of the time, how well do those discussions go for you all when you have conversations over Facebook and Twitter and people disagree with you? Is it usually that by the end of the feed, everyone agrees and they're all friends? I see a couple people shaking their heads no, right? A lot of times, people will have arguments on Facebook and Twitter and they'll start with their starting premises. Someone else will have the opposite starting premise and they never get anywhere. They just talk around each other rather than to each other. And so we don't get very far when we have this kind of mindset. The reason I'm teaching you stasis theory is so you can slow down and back up and hopefully have better arguments, not just on Facebook and Twitter, but hopefully in real life conversations with each other. So let's look at how interdependent, how connected all of the stases actually are. The first question that we have here is at the stasis of factor conjecture, we have a question over at what point does life begin? Different people with different backgrounds will answer this question differently. A lot of religious traditions will teach that life begins at conception, the very moment that sperm touches egg, it is life, and after that, it is sacred, right? A lot of scientists will try to answer this, and they'll have different arguments over when life actually begins. Some people will say it starts at conception, some people will say it starts when there's a heartbeat or when there's brain waves. Some people will say life doesn't actually begin until birth because the fetus is not viable outside of the womb. There are lots of different people who will argue over this question, and this is a question that science and religion both struggle to answer, and that's why the scientific and religious communities often butt heads on this. They're trying to solve the factual question or the conjectural question. They can't quite get there, but they do their best to make an argument for what point life begins at. From there, we have this question of definition. If we define the moment of life differently, then we also have to define what constitutes a human being. If any of you have ever seen the movie Juno, Juno is about a young teenage girl who gets pregnant. She gets pregnant, she's not sure what she wants to do about the baby. She decides originally that she wants to have an abortion. She goes to the abortion clinic and there's a protester standing outside the abortion clinic and uh, Juno's trying to walk in and this girl who goes to her high school says, you know your baby has fingernails, right? And Juno walks into the abortion clinic and she decides not to go through with the abortion. She decides to carry out her pregnancy. And that night she's talking to her friend on the phone and she's like, fingernails. For Juno, fingernails meant that this thing was now a human being and that it wasn't her place to do anything to end that human being's life as she saw it. But we haven't yet answered this question of at what point does life begin? Different communities still argue over that we have to have definitional arguments over what constitutes human and what constitutes not human. A lot of people will also have arguments from disability studies talking about how a lot of people will terminate a pregnancy if they think that their baby has some kind of birth defect. Let's say your baby might have Down syndrome or I happen to be a Tay-Sachs carrier, right? Uh, if your baby is not going to have a good quality of life, people might argue that it's not a human being. And yet there are lots of people with uh, those diseases, Down syndrome, autism, any kind of diseases, there are lots of people who would say, how dare you say that this person is not a human being? Are you calling me not human, right? That's the kind of argument that we're having. It gets very murky very quickly. But it goes on from there. We could also ask, aside from these kind of abstract philosophical questions of what constitutes life, what constitutes humanity, to whether abortion has particular effects. What effects does it have on the women who have them? What effects does it have on society?
There are lots of people who go and have abortions who say, I'm very glad I did that. I wasn't quite ready to be a mother. There are lots of people who say, I regret having an abortion and I'm haunted by the child that I lost. So we have lots of arguments about that. We have lots of arguments about whether abortion is good or bad for society. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. But what effects might it have to allow abortion or not? Prior to Roe v. Wade, there were lots of women who were having coat hanger abortions, which was very unsafe and also very painful. Right? And so part of the argument behind Roe versus Wade is if a society doesn't allow abortion, then women are going to still find alternative means, and some of those may not be safe or may not be pleasant. Right? Those are the kinds of uh, causes, and cons causes and consequences arguments that we could have. We also have this question of value. Aside from causes and consequences, is abortion ethical? Is abortion good? Who is it good for? Who is it bad for? Why is it good or bad? How do we know if it's good or bad? Those are the kinds of arguments that often result from the causal arguments that we're having here. Last but not least, we have this question of should the United States allow abortion? And if so, under what circumstances should we allow it? Should it be allowed only in certain cases like rape or incest? Should it be allowed at the federal level? Should states have the right to decide whether abortion is ethical? Should individual cities or maybe individual doctors and clinics have the power to decide? We want to rush to this stasis of policy in the United States. We love to have arguments over what we should or shouldn't do. And a lot of our deliberations end up being at the legal level of who gets to decide whether something is legal or illegal. And if you break the law, what is the penalty for breaking the law? What should the penalty be? I give you all of this in preparation for your deliberations that are coming up sooner than you think. They're still at the end of the semester, but you're going to want time to work on them. A lot of you are gonna to want to choose a topic and rush to the stasis of policy, but I'm hoping that you see how interconnected, how interdependent all of these stases actually are. If we can't answer some of the earlier questions, then you're likely to run into trouble with hostile audience members who come at this from a different perspective on one of the earlier questions. So as you're preparing for those, as you're thinking about what to do for your deliberations, that's what I want you to have in mind. We like to rush to the stasis of policy. My whole reason for teaching you this is to try and help you to figure out what it is that we're actually arguing about, to argue one thing at a time instead of seven, and to maybe see if we slow down a little bit. Maybe there's some common ground if we disagree at the stasis of policy. Maybe there's some common ground that we can build elsewhere. I'm going to leave you with that. We're going to come back after spring break. We're going to talk about the triangle of claims, which is stasis theory, evidence, and reasoning. So I'll leave you there. Thank you all. See you all in two weeks.